All right, welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green, bringing you brand new interviews right here on YouTube. Make sure you go to the link in the description, click on Patreon, sign up, and then you can ask questions of the guests. You probably have better questions um, than I do. Also, make sure you subscribe if you like this video, or even if you don't, make sure you subscribe. Okay, today I'm excited to have Mark Torian here. Uh, I've seen Mark over the last few years constantly on the road, and I've always wanted to have him on the show. And we finally found a time to make that happen. A lot of you know about his career with the Bullet Boys, but I'm also interested in his auditioning for Ozzy Osbourne and the time that he spent with Rat. He was the lead guitar player for Rat for a short time. We're going to talk about that. We'll talk about what went wrong. Uh, with the Bullet Boys reunion, and uh, we'll talk about all of those things and more right after that. All right, here it is, Mark Torian. Hey, Mark. Hi, Jay. How are you? Good. I'm glad to see you, and I see you've got a nice day outside there. Oh, it's so gorgeous today. Thank you so much. It's really great to see you, and thank you for having me on your show. We've been, we've been actually chatting it up a bit uh, every time we see each other. And we got to do the show, and and I said, yeah, let's do it. And finally, so here we are. Yay! Yeah, and I'll say as a precursor, one of the reasons I think you didn't want to come on right away is you didn't really want to talk trash or get into uh, the he said they said, and I think you wanted to let some of that sit for a minute. Um, absolutely. Yeah, which is great. And, and it's fine. There's plenty of things to talk about uh, as well. Like I was saying, um, you're, I'm very interested in your time with Rat because I see you out with Steven. And I think it's so cool when you come on stage uh, for You Think You're Tough. And you had a lot of involvement in that song. Before we get to that, Mark, I want to know, tell me a little about where you grew up. Well, I grew up in a city called Montebello. It's here in California, Montebello, California. Uh, it's in the San Gabriel Valley, and uh, it, uh, for all intents and purposes, it's very much a um, you know middle class town, a city within the city. But uh, the musical background of the city is really based in punk rock and R and B music, uh, a lot of it. So I grew up, you know, with that being born and raised here in Montebello. So yeah, it's uh, it's great. I I love my city. I love the people here, and. Uh, it's, um, it was, uh, how would you say, um, not too many folks or people that I know uh, in the music business have really come out of the city and, and really done anything like like <laughs> what my crazy uh, personality has done in the Bullet Boys, you know, and uh, other, it's, it's really been great. Uh, I love being from the city. I've actually moved back here here recently, and it's, it's great to see the... Um, what a large fan base of beautiful people that I have here in the city. And it's just been really, it's, it's really, um, how would you say it's a humbling thing, you know, that I was able to touch, uh, people with our music, you know? Yeah, for sure. And you, you're an Hispanic American, obviously were pe people into the same things as you, or were you a little bit of the, uh, the, the ugly stepchild or as they would say. Yeah. It was it the redheaded stepchild, I, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, I grew up in a very um, skater community. I grew up skateboarding, surfing, uh, grew up playing a lot of sports. Um, so it, um, I don't know, you know, for all intents and purposes, I always tell people, you know, my, my game is tennis. Um, my father was a, a stalwart tennis um, player. He had been his whole life. So I think if I didn't go to college and uh, become a pro tennis player, that's what I actually should have done, but I decided to break my family's heart and go into the music business. <laughs> well, but you, you oh, we, we lost Mark, he'll be back. There you go. Um, but you did make it work, you know, and they got to see your success as well. Oh no, ab absolutely. My, I love my family with all my heart. Um, they've been the stalwarts in, in my business. My, we just lost my father here about a year and a half ago, but my mother and father, and I miss him, may rest in peace, so 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 desperately. <laughs> but my mother and father are, have always been my champions in music, and um, 
have always been um, very supportive and I'm very, very, very blessed and very fortunate to have the parents that I, and that I do have because they drove me to, to do the things and to chase my dreams and to work really hard to facilitate doing those things and to become the person that I am in the music business and all the other steps it took to get to uh, the band, the Bullet Boys. And the world knows you as the lead singer for the Bullet Boys, but they might not know about your guitar playing. Mark, when did you get your first guitar? Oh my gosh. Um, wow. That's a great question, Jason. Uh, you know, I first got my first guitar. It was a, well, the guitar was an Aria, a uh, copy of a 335. Mm -hmm. um, I think when I was about, gosh, I would say about nine or 10, probably, about nine or 10. But uh, we always had old guitars lying around. I know my, my grandfather played guitars, so there were always, you know, that guitars lying around. My father, uh, as my mother and father are both musicians. Uh, my father was a trombonist for the uh, late great Stan Kenton Orchestra. So, uh, and played in a lot of different bands out of here. LA had his own, had his own band, had his own orchestra. So there was always musical equipment, you know, all, all the time around the house. Yeah, I always ask people, you know, we're talking about the late 70s now, probably, right? I think that's yeah, about right. Yeah, yeah. How do Early you learn 80s, to yeah. play? There's no YouTube, <laughs> you know. Uh, how do you learn to play guitar? Wow. Um, you know, I was playing guitars. Uh, actually, um, I wasn't singing, actually. I, I've always sang, but I, I was always trying to be the guitarist for bands, even when I was like 11 or 12. Uh I would have my mother would drive me to these auditions of these bands that are playing and I'd be the guitar player and they work for a little while and then they'd hear me start singing. They go, why do you need to sing in this band? And we're like, oh, shoot. But I, I've been playing guitar for as long as I can think. I mean, as long as I can think I've been playing guitar easily since I was about seven or eight years old. You know, um, <clears throat> I love the guitar. I love uh, every aspect of the, the instrument. Um, I dedicated myself to the guitar for many, many years. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's an instrument that I have a, um, what is a love hate affair with because you're never as good as you want to be. You know, it's, you're never as good as, you're never as good as the grades. So you're never good as, you know, I always feel that way because you're, you're always able to, to be better and better and learn new things constantly uh, as, as a guitarist. Were you self taught or were you taking lessons? No, I'm self taught. Yeah. Which is, My, uh, yeah, we said back in the day, you know, when we used to spin vinyl, um, I just sit there and listen constantly to vinyl and constantly to uh, uh, the guitarists that I was listening to growing up on vinyl and constantly trying to uh, facilitate copying them would be like um, uh, first guys would be like uh, Wes Montgomery, um, the great Wes Montgomery, um, the the great Jeff Beck, may he rest in peace. Um the guys that I first started with guitar, like that were my guys. Um, I loved uh, John Fogarty. <laughs> I thought he was an amazing guitar player. Um, there was just guys that I kind of gravitated to, you know? Yeah. And, and you, you're not going to be just a casual guitar player, as we're going to hear about in a minute here. You, you know, uh, you, weren't, you weren't just a three chord, uh, have some fun kind of guy. Mark, no. what did you change your name? to what it is now, because your, your last name, uh, you, maybe you feared that people wouldn't be able to pronounce it, and your first name you added to Q. At what, what point do you do that? When I was a kid, when I was in high school, you know, it was just, uh, it was just something that, um, that ne I needed to shorten my last name because a lot of people didn't really, they couldn't pronounce my last name. It's a oh. Chilean last name, so it's, it was kind of difficult for people to pronounce. So, um, a lot of the guys would, you know, they couldn't pronounce my name either. So they would call me, you know, Torian, hey, Mark, you know, hey, Torian, you know, they would never call me my last name. So I just kind of went with it, you know, and said, oh, you know what, I'm going to be Mark Torian. And um, and that was that was about it. What about the Q? Was there anything behind the, the fact to add a Q to the last name? Your first name? No, I, I just. Um, it was just something that. Uh, that I kind of did that just would change the and make my name a little bit uh, stand out a little bit more, you know. Yeah. 
It, and it did, I think, as the Bullet Boys. You know, I, back in the day, we learned about our favorite bands and magazines. Nowadays, I don't think people can name half the guys in a band. But when you no, saw a guy whose name was Mark with a Q, it, you remember it. <laughs> Yes, it did. Absolutely. I still get that, too. People go, Mark, with the Q. It's like, what's going on? It's like, oh, that's right on. No, but that's all, it's always been like that since I was a very, very young. You know, I would always play with stuff. I love, you know, I'm an, an artist also, too. I'd love to draw stuff. So I'd always, you know, paint up my name or what have you and try to come up with different things because I wanted to be like the David Bowies of the world. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I just wanted to be that type of person, you know? Absolutely. Now, before and you talk about playing in bands when you're younger, before there's a rat in your life, I believe uh, Cagney and the Dirty Rats comes first. Is that right? Uh, I, be I believe so. I think you're right about that. I get Cagney and the Dirty Rats with Motown, with the greatest, yeah. greatest uh, record label ever in the world. Oh, yes. Thank you for mentioning that. Yes, I, uh, I was very, very very fortunate and blessed to be signed with Motown and um, still consider myself part of the Motown family. Uh, they were the first label that I, um, that signed me as an artist and I was the guitar player and singer in a band called Cagney and the Dirty Rats. <clears throat> and it was, um, I was signed by Benny Medina and Carrie Ashby Gordy Jr. And the experience that I had at Motown is definitely the greatest experience I've, I've ever had. I think in my career um, it's, really taught me things about myself and music that I thought at the time I was, you know, that I was really, you know, this, uh, how would you say, um, really had all my, all my faculties together as a musician. I was a badass and I could do this and I could play this. But when it really came down to it, when I signed with Motown, I realized that I wasn't who I thought I was, but had to realize there was a, uh, it was a learning uh, it was a time for learning and maybe taking some of the stuff when I was younger and moving it up to the forefront of being a better musician, learning how to really appreciate the people that were, were around me. I mean, Jason, man, I was, you know, I was around the great Rick James was, you know, helped write the record. Um, Junior, Ho Junior Walker blew horn on that record. Um, the great Smokey Robinson sang on that record with us. Um, uh, the list goes on and on. The Temptations actually sang backgrounds on that record. And it was just like, just an unbelievable experience for me. Just still to this day, I still, I still think about the things and I'm very blessed that Benny and um, Carrie took the time to, uh, to sign me to, to Motown. Yeah. And you were, you know, you're a kid essentially at the time, your yeah. age, your age will also become a double edged sword. Age and yes. guitar are two things in your life that are, are, like you say, love, hate, and will cause you some problems. So at some right. point, we, we, know that, we know that Randy Rhodes, uh, when he passed away tragically in the plane crash, they were looking for guitar players. I've had so many people on this show who auditioned for that gig or thought they were close to it. George Lynch was the craziest of all the stories. They actually brought him out at one point to trail uh, Brad Gillis, and he was going to take over. And every and uh, a lot of people, Amir Derok, uh, a lot of the same names, especially from the San Diego area, were all trying to get in the Aussie at different times. And one of the guitar players who was very close to the gig is you. Yes. Tell me Absolutely. about how you, how you knew about this and how you got in. Yeah, well, the story is basically, it uh, was pretty simple. Um, Greg Jeffria from Angel, uh, was my mentor at the time uh, that was helping me and introducing me to a, a lot of different people. I mean, I, I have to give Greg so much credit um, because when I came out of the city, out of Montebello and into Hollywood, I was playing um, a club in Hollywood called the Troubadour. And I would play there in my high school band, Street Piece Band. Then he brought so many amazing, huge rock stars to come and see me. Uh, um, Gene Simmons, Paul Stanley, Rick Derringer. Uh, I mean, I, I could just go on and on. And up. I know it sounds crazy, but he would bring these guys to come and see me play because he really was behind my talent. So long story short, excuse me, um, he 
knew Ozzy and Sharon and knew that they were looking for a guitar player. So I got a call at about, I think about eight o'clock in the morning or something like that um, at my mother's house because I was young, living at my mom and dad's house still. And it was Greg. And he said, listen, I need you to bring your guitar. I want you to come up to the house. Uh, he had a place up in the hills. Um, and I said, okay. So I go, why, why, what's going on so early? He goes, there's somebody here that, that wants to hear a guitar playing, you know, don't, don't fuck up, dude, <laughs> you know, get here now. You know, it's like, okay, okay, okay. Don't, don't ask me so many questions. So I drove up there and sure enough, I walked in the door and Ozzy and Sharon were there. And, uh, it was just blew my mind. I bought my, you know, my little, my guitar, my little amp. And he sat down and, uh, and Sharon was so lovely and so kind to me and, thanked me for coming up there and he said can you play some guitar for me you know do you know any do you know any of my songs yeah and i started playing you know over the mountain and what have you and started playing i mean he just loved the way i played and we sat there for a while and uh he asked me if i would you know be into you know playing with the band or auditioning and coming in and playing and i was like wow this, yes you know what do you need from me so after meeting him there um he just kind of brought me in and I started rehearsing at SIR with the whole full band. Um, Rudy Sarzo was very much um, really helpful in that whole situation because I was scared to death playing in that band. I mean, <laughs> I was so young and here I am, you know, with the legend himself who was such a sweetheart to me and so kind, uh, Ozzy. He was, and um, first of all, he went, we went up to Charvel. He bought guitars for me. Um, uh, Grover was really great, put together some guitars for me. I love Grover. Shout out to him. Um, I've known Grover for so many years, too. I bought one of my first guitars from him um, up in San Dimas with Charvel. Long story short. So here he comes back into the fold. And I just started playing with the band. And uh, I thought I was doing really well. I thought, the you know, he seemed to really enjoy it, loved it, loved the way I played. Um all that aside, uh, we were ready to go. The first dates were in England. Uh, I had all my stuff ready uh, at the house, ready for somebody to come and pick me up. And and in between there, we were he would had invited me up to the, to their home, and it was really great. He was awesome up there. Would show me these amazing films of Randy playing that they had uh, on eight millimeter. Uh, so I got to see that and. Uh, Brad Gillis was a big help too. Shout out to Brad. I love him so dearly. Um, I listened to a lot because he was playing with Ozzy at the time and got to listen to a lot of um, their live, the live tapes. Uh, like they made live cassette tapes of him playing for me. So I listened to a lot of that and Brad was just amazing playing, playing that stuff. Just uncanny, just incredible. Um, to, to me, I was just like, wow, I got to, I got to play better than this guy. So some people, some people think that the Brad Gillis live album, the speak of the Aussie album, speak of the devil is the best uh, Aussie live playing there is, which is Brad on guitar. A lot of people. Really you know, like I got it. I got to tell you some, some aspects. I absolutely do agree. Brad was knocking it out of the park. He was just uh, everything tonality, stage presence, the way he played the songs, really aggressive. He was just, rad. I love Brad. Uh, but so then I had to step it up on my own and really sleep and play those parts, everything. So I knew it like the back of my hand, going back to sitting in the house. So I'm sitting there, car doesn't show up on the time that they're supposed to show up, waiting, waiting, waiting. It goes into night. No one shows up. No one calls. <clears throat> Next day, I wake up going, what's going on? Had the bags packed, the whole thing, sitting in the living room. Nothing's going on at all. Absolutely nothing. Um, then it was the third day. So then we got a call. So um, I got a call actually from Sharon and she actually wanted to speak to my mom at first. So she was able to speak to her first and talk with her a bit. And then she, I got on the phone and she just said, listen, you know, I'm so sorry. Things aren't going to work out. We're going to uh, we're going to roll with a uh, uh, with a guitar player that we know out here by the name of Bernie Torme. And we love you dearly. But right now, Ozzy feels there's a lot of similarities to you and to Randy, and I do too. And we're still trying to get over Randy right now, Mark. And we love you. We think you're an extraordinary guitar player. She was just so sweet and beautiful. But here, here I am sitting in that going, oh, wow. You know, so, you know, they, 
gave me the guitars and the equipment and stuff and, and it just didn't work out. I think they just thought that I was just a bit too young, you know? Um, and that's basically almost verbatim what she had told me and my mother. So there you have it. Yeah. Talk, talk, talk about an opportunity as a young person, you might be thinking, and you can tell us there'll be more. I, I, I'll get the next one. <laughs> Well, now, you see, this is the thing. I was, I was crushed beyond belief. I mean, I can't even tell you how I was just like, I thought it was me. I thought I wasn't playing good enough. If I, you know, you start, you start thinking of things. And it's like, I'm not good enough. I'm, this isn't, you know, blah, 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 blah. I worked so hard at this. What happened? You know, and then you just find out that it was, you know, what she, what she had explained to me or tried to explain to me that I was, you know, just too young at the time. But, and that, uh, and I, I I was actually in the uh, in the LA Times in the, on the front page of the LA Times, <laughs> and I got the gig. So it was kind of it, it was it one joke was like it was like oh cool, and the other joke was like oh shit, you know it's a, this this thing. So and that's when Stephen Piercy and Robin approached me to come in and play with Rat after that gig fell out. Yeah, and. Listen, you had the Ozzy gig. You were, you know, uh, obviously now people are going to talk about you even more. You're sought after. And uh, those guys know, hey, if he's good enough yeah. for Ozzy, he's good enough for us. I, I believe, and you could set it straight, the story was maybe they weren't getting along with Warren at the time and Warren was taking a little break. Well, yeah, he was, they weren't, they, from what I understood, you know, at the time that they just were, didn't want him in the band anymore. They were done. Um, there was some friction there, and so I I don't know the inner workings of what was going on before I came in, but I just knew that uh, <laughs> I was really close with Stephen and and Robin, and I just hailed them. I just loved them and loved the band, and I was always around. And um, they knew that I was hanging around, you know, the circuit and the thing that just happened with Ozzy. And um, I came in, and I loved being, I loved playing in Rat. I just I had such a great time in the band. And uh, I think what happened was, you know, Robin was told me at some point, you know, I, I actually came into rehearsal when everything was all over and, Rob, you know, Warren was playing on the gear, on my gear or his gear or whatever. My gear was just like, I was like, wow, what happened? And it, it, it crushed me after the whole thing. I mean, it was like, it was brutal because I loved being part of Rat. I was, um, you know, I was in the band probably for almost maybe a year, um, but I helped them write uh, one of their first hit songs, which is "You Think You're Tough," and with Robin and Steven, and some other songs. And for all intents and purposes, you know, I have so much high respect, just brotherhood and high respect for Steven, um, because he had the tenacity that I got to see and be a part of at the time of how he got signed. <clears throat> he wouldn't take no for an answer. He worked so diligently, constantly. It was a 24 seven thing. One of the things I do remember, I, I don't I don't know if you remember, if, if, if you'll agree with me, but I remember always seeing a, um, he had a hanging calendar. And at the end of each month, at the very last day of the month, he wrote in, rat will be signed on this day. So, those kind of things are manifest when they're when you're manifesting something, you know, back in the day. So I got to see these things that he was doing with the band, and it was I was had so much respect for him. I mean, that he had to let me go. I mean, they even told me they listen. You know, Stephen told me, Mark, you're such an amazing singer. You got to start your own band. You put your own thing together, and and you're gonna make it. You know what I'm saying? Like he was so loving and so was Robin. I mean, you know, it was, it spurred me to do what I needed to do. <laughs> I'll never forget. Um, I used to come to the shows when they were huge and I went to one of the shows at um, uh, sports arena or something. Maybe, maybe it was. And, um, and I'm watching them play and they sounded great, you know, and I'm just, I'm just so bummed out, but it's so ecstatic for them making it finally, you know, and I remember going and, and almost going in the front and standing right there just so I could see what's going on. And Robin came all the way over from the right-hand side of the stage and came over, pointed at me, and played right to me like, 
for a long time, man. And that told me right there that like he loved me and he had respect for me, you know? So things like that, that I remember in my head, you know, just little things like that were always great. But, you know, I got to see rat become so huge and, um, it was such an exciting time and, and, you know, bands like that help spur other bands like myself that, you know, put together both boys to say, yeah, listen, you know, let's follow our mentors and our guys that have made this and let's put our own thing together and, and come out and, you know, with how fire and take the world over, you know? <laughs> so yeah. that's, that's basically it kind of in a nutshell, you know, but well, I, uh, give I want to go real quick. Well, I wanted to go real quick. I'm so sorry. Yeah. No, I want to give people a timeline of this because I some there's so much going on. So Randy Rhodes passed away in 1982, so we know that the Rat EP and the songs were being written. The band was playing that year as well. The EP comes out in 1983. It's for, we're going to go on 40 years, uh, if you can believe it, since that Rat EP mm -hmm. comes out. Yeah. Who was playing bass when you were in Rat? Uh, Juan Crucier. Okay, so Juan was in at that point. Because I know he went, he was going back and forth between Doc and a little bit. Yes, he would come into rehearsal and he would say, you, you know, he, he'd show up late all the time. And, and Bobby was furious. He'd start screaming at him. Hey, man, how come you're always late, man? It's me. Come on. And he goes, listen, Bobby, I love you guys. I love all you guys. But, you know, I play in Doc and, man, I'm, you know, I'm trying to help you guys out. <laughs> so that was, that was his thing at the time. And, you know, I'm so young. I'm just sitting there like and going like, wow. You know, look at these guys working. These guys are, you know, like, whoa. You know? <laughs> but, yeah, I remember that he would tell them all the time. And Steve told them, st told them one day, dude, you're not in that band. You're a rat. Get over here. You know, let's get this thing going. So, but Steve no, Bobby. And Go ahead. Bobby and, 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 and Juan were a wrecking machine of a, mm -hmm. of a rhythm section. Uh, the power and the finesse that they both had as – talented super still talented super music musicians were was amazing to watch uh, when we rehearsed I used, yeah. to, I used to i used to really be in awe of it and it's it was a learning process for me too learning <clears throat> how the you know how it really worked how really you know a bit older cats did their thing and and how they were so serious about it because sometimes you know you know when you're young you don't take things as much seriously but it really taught me a lot of things and uh um i, I want to just say real quick, I love Robin Crosby with all my heart. I, I miss him dearly. Um, he was such an angel to me when I was young and taught me so much about guitar tones, uh, strings, um, anything that had to do with guitar. Because when I first came into the band, I was doing different things with my amps. And, and you know, Robin really helped me get to another level of trying different things that he was doing at the time um uh with equipment and different you know different settings and firmans and lexicons and you know blah 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 not to get technical but you know i just he was just an incredible human being on uh, first of all he had a huge gigantic heart and you don't find those type of people in the business these days you know so i just want to give him all the credit too because he was the one that with with steven uh that pulled me into rat yeah, you're not alone in that sentiment. Most people have very good things to say about Robin. They say that Robin was very protective. Matt Thorne yeah. uh, tells me a fun story about, in the yeah, beginning, Stephen might, have been, Stephen might have been a little bit of a hard driver. Hey, get this gear, pick that. And then he, Matt hey. told me that Robin, <laughs> yeah. and, you know. Totally. So, that Robin sort of was kind of the defender for everybody. I asked Stephen yeah. before. You know, the guys in Rat had so much trouble getting along at times. And Robin right. could literally just get between people. He was a big yes, guy. He yeah, and he would, he would, oh man, he shut people down so hard. I remember back in the day, I, I don't think, I, you know, I don't think Bobby really, really wanted me in the band. I just got that feeling in the very beginning. You know, he just really wasn't feeling me, maybe because I was young. I don't know what it was, but, you know, he was very, um, uh, very mean spirited to me at times. And uh, it was, you know, it was really intimidating. And, you know, Robin would come in and, and shut him down so hard. I mean, it was just like, 
you know, he was just like, you know, the bot, my bodyguard, he was, don't listen to that guy, you know, keep on doing this, you know, and he would have to crawl up Bobby's keister sometimes, you know, but uh, no, it, Robin just was amazing. I, for people that didn't know him and, and that, you know, read this and that and the other, I'm, I'm just here to testify that he was one of the most brilliant musicians that I ever knew and uh, the most kindest, uh, gentlest soul that, and big, with the biggest heart, you know? Yeah, a very underrated musician. As oh, rat really? fans know, he was the lead guitar player in the beginning. And at one yeah, point, yeah. It would be both of them, most of those solos on the EP, a lot of them, I should say, uh, Robin plays. And it wasn't until EP. Warren. Yeah. yeah, on the EP. It's a Warren became such a sensation that I think management and people started to say, wow, this kid is really shining. Warren also is younger, uh, is shining. You yes. know, and then the dynamic changed. You will hear people like Steven say that Rat, the, that dynamic died with Robin. When Robin was no longer part of the band, uh, he felt well, like it yes. had to be. No, I, I, agree, I agree. He was the uh, glue that held everything together. And that big giant tone and his presence, uh, King, was unmatched, period. It's, uh, you, you know, some of these things, as you said, it's, it's so love-hate and it, to be so close to these things, you watch Ozzy take off. Uh, he was already huge, but you see it. Then you see Rat become huge. Right. And you're out there right. knowing, I've got something. People are looking at me. Uh, you you did sing for King Cobra for a little while. Yes, yes. I got drugged into that for a minute. Uh, I didn't say it like that. I, the, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to joke about that, but... Um, it was something that I did kind of reluctantly because I really didn't want to drop the guitar, but I got to, I got to give it to my, my brother, Lonnie Vincent, uh, who started the, the bullet boys with me. Um, <laughs> he was the one that said, listen, come and sing for this band. I know you don't want to drop the guitar, but dude, you, you're just an incredible front man. And what have you, I love you. Come and do this, man. Let's go, you know, come into this thing. And so I went into it and, you know, I, I had a good time, but it was, it was just really difficult. I was coming in, you know, like kind of like this other, this new singer and I'm singing their old songs. And it's just, it was just different times back then. And I wanted something that was uh, my own. I was at that point, I didn't want to be playing with, you know, guys that already had something that was going on. I wanted to be in this fresh new thing. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So it led to what, how we, started the bullet boys and that's how we when we met mick in the band and yeah, uh mick that's and Lonnie both you know, in that band the same. Yeah. i had played in in bands prior way prior to that with lonnie we were always you know together he was my best friend and um and he was looking out for me to give me a gig to do something you know and he thought that would be great coming and sing for king cobra but I, and i and and it was great you know it's was, it was great for a little while carmine was amazing you know He's this amazing, um, you know, savant musician and you're young and you're just trying to, you know, catch up and trying to learn these songs and trying to do the best you can with what you have. And then um, so it was just um, I, I don't know. Um, it was something that was like an in-between thing for me. I wasn't really in the band. I don't think I really didn't have, you know, a lot of love for the band or the music. But I had love for Lonnie and I wanted to be there and and do something and work with musicians that you know that were signed and do you know and put albums out so <laughs> at that point <clears throat> excuse me it was just like i don't know and then after that i just we all lonnie got tired of it and he's like you know listen man I, I'm, I'm over this we, we need to get and start our own band we've got all these songs and uh mick at the time he he was over it um, really, really over it, and he wanted to leave the band too. So we just started getting together and writing songs, and you know, four tracking it, old school style, and um, and all of a sudden, you know, we're you know, we we have these songs written, and we decided it was just time to start this new thing and put everything in to what we were creating um, as the Bullet Boys. Yeah, and uh, now you're going to put the guitar down for a long time at this point. Is it tough for you to be in yes. a band where you're not going to play guitar? And now Mick is the guitar player. Do you ever feel like, well, hey, I'm an accomplished guitar player myself. I could do this or you should do that. Is it, does, do you butt heads over it? Well, you know, 
back when we do it, back when we started and, and Mick came in and was the only guitar player, I was, I was just concentrating on trying to still be that front man and to take my skills as a front man to another level, to, to be a showman, to be the things that I am and to, to find these things. So at the time I wasn't thinking about, oh, I got to play guitar because Mick was just doing an amazing job at doing as being just the one guitar player. And Mick had just come from a two guitar player band. I don't, he was never comfortable with me playing guitar. We would play guitar together, we're working music. Um, I'd sit around and show him different things that I was doing in lead and solo wise and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, show him some things, you know, and um, open up his mind to uh, other things, other things, guitar wise. Um, but uh, it, I would have loved to play guitar too, but it never, never really happened. So you're a haunting work. I just though, Mark, obviously. Yeah, obviously it worked. Yeah, it worked. You know, your Motown influence shows in the way that you front the bullet boys, uh, you know, you're oh, you're, you're, you're a and dance thank man up there, you. and maybe you couldn't do that if you played guitar the whole time. You do play some guitar currently in the band, um, but yeah, uh, yes, I, absolutely. At the time, I yeah, think it the kinda, world it really did run. Yeah, yes, it was. Um, it, it does hinder you a bit, you know, when you're playing guitar and and and, and fronting, but it's uh, I, I I'll I'll never you know it's something that. That I've always been very grateful to to Lonnie for having the faith in me at the time to be this person and to step out of my own shell and be this this guy <laughs> because he's seen it a lot. He says, you, you know, you did it at Motown. Just do the same thing that you did at Motown, just without the guitar. It's like, oh, okay, <laughs> but it was well, great. I mean, it still is great. I, I love. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. A lot of Van, a lot of Van Halen influence, obviously. Ted Templeman produces the first record. We could never imagine David Lee Roth playing guitar. We we know him as the front man, and I think that's what people um, got to know you. I think it wasn't until years later that people started to hear about Ozzy and Rat. I'm talking about uh, the, the nationally, you know, yeah. locally they knew that. But you created it all. Yeah. yeah, I don't think most people knew, and obviously yeah. you weren't a shabby yes. guitar player. Yeah. Oh, thank um, you, thank you so much. Uh, I, I, you know, it's like after, after everything was said and done, you have to reinvent yourself, Jason. And, you know, everybody's asked me, well, why don't, why don't you have blonde hair anymore? Why don't you do it? Because you have to reinvent yourself. You can't just be pigeonholed or the same thing. I, I'm, I'm a chameleon. <laughs> I've always learned to, you know, not only change with the times, but, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you know, find new different things as an artist and you know to to make yourself look and the way you look and blah blah blah, blah. but you know it, it, i'm i'm still the same person i i still got the same uh pretty much the same vocal ability uh, i would say i'm very blessed with that um i'm working really hard um right now creating a double album for the bullet boys to possibly be released next year well not possibly it's definitely going to be released next year but Get on the calendar you know, will happen. music's music's changed music um the business has changed um at the time it was a very lead singer fronted rock and roll situation and i always believed if we could be a two guitar player band you know you would have more weapons or more things to, to more of an arsenal at your disposal um bigger sound a couple songs what have you and that's what the band kind of morphed into after the guy the guys had left for years i said i'm gonna put the guitar strap that thing back on come out and play make it a two guitar band reinvent it and now here we are myself ira black brad lang fred aching i can't tell you how much i love these guys their dedication to the business the, the fun that we have together without even playing music, it's easy. And when it's easy, good music comes out of it. You know, everybody's a different personality and you have like this conflict musically, but it all makes sense at the end. And we're coming up with this really amazing rate. I'm, I'm really happy with the music that we're coming up with. And um, 
I think people are going to be really stoked because we're trying to shine some light and trying to bring uh, a little less politics and a little bit more fun and a little bit more rock and roll to what's going on. That is not a bad thing. Mark, I was saying earlier, we run into each other all across the country in different double trees and Hiltons and Marriott's. Totally. And, uh, and uh, you are always uh, an incredibly pleasant and nice guy. I don't work with you, so I can't say it all the time, but I, I will say that wow. you've been great. I want, I want to share, Mark, the first time Thank I ever you. met you. This okay. is a picture that I'm gonna show right now. And this Good picture, shit. I'm not positive of the year, but I'm gonna say this is maybe 1991. The venue is CBGB's. Uh, here, I, here, here we are. Lonnie Vincent is missing. That's kind of been a pattern sometimes. Oh my <laughs> gosh, yes. But look that at all that hair. Epic. So rad. Uh, you, guys, <laughs> so rad. you guys were on tour with Poison. And somebody yeah. in Poison got sick. I think it was going to be at the Meadowlands in New Jersey. And you guys wanted to play a show, a, a pickup show. You had the night off because all suddenly. And uh, Bullet yep. Boys played CGBs. Me and a few of my friends went. It was a great intimate yep. show. And uh, this picture was taken. I think it's sound check maybe. Um, but what a cool memory no. of one of the most legendary venues of all time. Um, and Please so send that to me. Yes, I will. Absolutely. And uh, I think so I have some other amazing. pictures from, from that night um, as well. But so, okay, so mm -hmm. let's talk a little so, bit about people yeah, don't we'll talk, People don't believe me. They don't believe me when I tell them the band played CBGBs a couple times. No one ever believes me. So thank you for having that picture. <laughs> yes, there, there is the, the proof. It was, a, it was a fun night. I think it was a week night. And you had the local people yeah, it was and the so people it out. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, the place was, place was packed. It was so much fun. We threw it down. It was so great. What a great, ex amazing experience still to this day for me. Yeah. Oh, what a, you, you played a lot of key places in your career. Uh, being a West Coast band, even yeah. cooler to get to play CBGB is a place that maybe you wouldn't have, you know, you, no. the Bullet Boys is already too big to play a place <laughs> like that. You could only play it as a secret show. Yeah. Um, no, absolutely. So we were. Uh, I was. I was scared to death to, to play CBGBs. It was one of the most frightening shows I think I've ever played ever. Um, I just, you know, coming from a punk rock base when I was a kid, um, rock and roll, R and B type of thing. You know, I just was like, wow, man, we really got to throw it this down. So ridiculously ugly in here. And we all. I remember we all got together before we played, and we're all looking at each other like, okay. <laughs> Let's bring this. Let's bring this like at a real stupid loud. Let's get ridiculous because we used to break all of our equipment all the time. I don't. I don't know if people really knew that, but I. Some people know it because they saw it. But <laughs> we thought we were the Who, and we would break real stuff. I mean, real drum sets. Uh, Mick would bust over his equipment. You know, all kinds of stuff. Bust real Gibson Les Pauls. We were just out of control because we were high on alcohol and chemical refreshments. But that's another time, another story. <laughs> well, we but that that's show. what we would do. So we, were, we, were like, we were like that night, we're telling our manager, Dave, and, going, and, and Jimmy's like, we're going to break everything tonight. And Dave's like, no, 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 no don't do that. Goes, we're yes, we're in CBGB's. That's the time to do it. We're going to bust everything. Lonnie, you're going to bust everything. Yeah, I'm going to bust everything up. And we didn't do it. We were... We were uh, not alone. <laughs> Which Lonnie sucks. That, uh, yeah, you had the moment. Lonnie played that show in his boxer shorts. I remember that. Uh, so uh, nothing else. Yeah. 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 So there was yes. definitely uh, an attitude and a vibe. So I don't want to dwell too much on, yeah. on boys' uh, uh, controversies, if you will. But I had Mick Sweeta on yeah. the show twice. I had him on before. The, uh, well, during the your, your reunion got shut down during the pandemic, like everybody. So you did the one gig, some time went off, and uh, and he urged everyone to go see the reunion. And then I had him back on, and it was over. And I don't completely understand what went wrong, although I know there's a lot of personalities. I know there's a lot of history. There was a show at the Whiskey. Lonnie Vincent missed his flight, um, and you wanted to play the show as an acoustic show. Mick did not. I, I guess Jimmy did not either. 
Um, mm. I, I understand the different points. I understand that maybe they wanted to play it as a, an electric or don't do it. You felt like people traveled a long way. I at least want to give them something. So it, it, it didn't seem to me something worth ending a reunion over. Um, but yet that's what happened. You know, I don't know what it was, to be honest with you, but I can tell you this. Um, I would have never left. First of all, um, the whiskey, those people are family to me. Uh, they've always been there for me for many, many years. Um, I would never keep my family hanging or any of my friends uh, who are my fans. Um, I wouldn't ever, ever do that. I, I can't do that unless I was death, extremely ill, sick or you know, powers that be, we couldn't do it, but, uh, I just didn't feel it was right. You know, we, we were supposed to be there and it was time to perform. It doesn't, the show must go on. So that's what I've been taught. And that's the way I've always been in my career. Um, as far as the original guys, you know, I'm just going to be really honest. I, I don't, I have a lot of love and will always have love for them, but there's nothing really, to say, I mean, really, uh, I wish them the best in their musical endeavors. I, I, I hold no ill will toward anybody. I love them with all my heart. I just was talking with Bonnie a couple days ago. We chat all the time. But yeah, um, I, know you're in contact. You know, I know you're still in contact with Lonnie. Um, I'm assuming you haven't spoke to the other two. No, I was... Uh, I was taken aback by uh, some of the things that they both had to say. And, you know, listen, I don't, I, I'm not, I, I will never bash anybody or speak disparagingly about people uh, that I love or that maybe that's something that didn't work out uh, musically. But like I say, I wish them the best and with everything they do and, and, you know, good luck in this crazy business. But, you know, we move forward and uh, we got to do what we got to do. It seems like, you guys really were doing it for the fans. I, I did get that impression. I don't feel like, you know, yeah. of course everyone wants to work and there was an interest. There are no real original lineups. I think Winger is one of the only ones, maybe Poison. Other than that, I don't think there's any original lineups. At that point, you and Bang Tango, Bullet Boys, Bang Tango, both had the lineups, both had some issues. Um, sometimes when you're not the biggest band in the world, you know, Maybe a band like Motley Crue or Aerosmith or Van Halen, if they don't like each other, they could travel separate or this or that. But for you guys to do these shows, right. um, there's obviously a lot of issues that uh, reappeared. And so uh, I, had, I had great I had a great time playing with them. I, I loved them. We had great shows. I was loved it. I walked into the thing for the fans um, to do something really special. And, you know, I, there was a lot of turmoil before I even came back to the band that I didn't know about. So when I walked back into it, there was already this friction of the three of them that they hadn't even spoke like in months before I even like came past, back to it. So it was, you mean like past drama coming back? For, for them, yeah, for things that they had gone through in some other project they were playing in. But... That was, you know, I, I didn't know about any of those things. So I came in with an open heart, ready to work and ready to do some things. Um, I know that uh, we put together, um, try to put together something to release to the fans musically. And that was very difficult. Um, I, I don't know why. I've written all kinds of songs. We had all kinds of stuff. And I don't know, you know, just it wasn't in the cards at the time, you know, and people have different I don't know. I, I don't know. I just, uh, I just, you'll never hear me bashing those guys. I love them. I love them dearly. And uh, I, I don't feel it's right. I being in the business so long, um, you don't come up and talk disparagingly about people that you love and that you've worked with. So I, I and I don't, I have nothing but uh, for, with love for those guys. And, and like I'll say again, not to be redundant, but I wish them the best in the future and the best in their musical career. Yeah, and they and they everyone has their own projects. Um, you hold the mark for the Bullet Boys. You have all this time. You're the voice of the Bullet Boys as well. So you continue. You mentioned the lineup that's out there and playing. 
double record uh, coming next year. We'll put a link in the description so people can follow you and 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 keep up with it. And like you said, you're playing a lot yeah. of shows. You're out there constantly, and um, and you, I, I feel like you're playing the songs that people want to hear. You do the show that people want to see. I, it seems like people are, are very happy. I see, you know, I've seen you on a few bills, and the people are um, enjoying it. So I, I, I would ask the question. There'd be a reunion again, but I'm not sure it's something you could answer. No, I, I can't answer that question right now. Um, you know, I'm just ec ec ecstatic about the guys that I'm playing with. I think it's definitely the best that I've played with in, in, in many, many years. Um, and we're filling rooms and the fans have just been so endearing to uh, Brad, myself, Ira and Fred. And, you know, we've, we've been together for almost over a year and a half. Uh, we're playing a lot of festivals this year. Um, and we're playing a, a lot of different, uh, have many, many shows that are coming up. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm just, you know, you go day by day. Um, I have a lot of faith um, in the Lord. And he guides me. Uh, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes like everybody else does in this crazy world. But I just try to do the best I can with what I have. And right now, I feel like I'm really, really blessed um, and ecstatic about the new music that we're writing, ecstatic about the touring that we're doing, um, all the love and everything. My biggest heart I can throw out hearts to all the fans that have been there for me. And I, I don't consider my fans fans. I, I consider them more family. Um, I chat with them all the time. At shows, I know you see me, Jason. I, um, there's always somebody that I know, or you know, that's been with us for a long time, and you know, we're kind of like the, I don't know, it just it's just Bullet Boys. We got the, you know this different thing. We just there's just something a little a little different about us, you know. That's I, mean, I enjoy the, I enjoy the dynamic when I see you at the last show, uh, Canyon Club. Stephen said we're going to get Mark up to sing, and uh, yes. we're coming to that song. You think you're tough. And I said, I don't know where he is. I haven't seen Mark tonight. And then, yeah. uh, like a cat burglar dressed in black, you appeared on stage uh, to sing. And then, just like that, you were gone uh, into the night. And uh, But it, it was a, a fun uh, thing for everyone to see. And a little bit of rat history. That night in particular, Matt Thorne on bass, he played on the metal. Amazing. Mat. Yeah, he's yes. amazing. I love Matt. Yeah. He's so, so bad. I so just love him so dearly. Big, time, big respect. A lot of uh, a lot of fun uh, history there. So I was glad to see you. I, I would say that your career is like a Rocky story, which will lead me to the segue of Rocky Four because ah! I, can't let, I can't let this go. <laughs> I find it incredibly interesting. Uh, a friend of mine, Joe Esposito, he wrote a song um, called "You're the Best Around." It's in the movie The Karate Kid. It was supposed <laughs> to go in Rocky Three, but there was label problems. Uh, Scotty Brothers oh, yes. and, and but uh, Stallone, Stallone uh -huh. really liked it. He then wrote the same guy, Joe, he wrote a song called, uh, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the song right now, but it was for the Rocky IV soundtrack, but John Cafferty ended up singing it because he was on the right label. Well, it turns oh, out that you ha had a song that Stallone <laughs> really liked. T tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, the song's called The Sweetest Victory, and it was written by Dwayne Hitchings and Jake Hooker, and I met them, I was living in a place in Marina Del Rey, and the person, the, the person that uh, that I was uh, was my friend that I was uh, a roommate with. He met this guy, Dwayne Hitchings, who lived close by, and he was out working out or doing whatever. And met this guy and said, "Hey, I, I the, you know, my brother Mark, he's he's an amazing singer, man. You, you got to check this guy out." He says, "Well, we're looking for somebody to sing the song that we wrote uh, for the Rocky Former picture." So he comes in, dude, you got to get your ass back. I just met this guy. I got all about whoa, 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 what's up? He goes, dude, I just met this guy. His name's Dwayne Hitchings. He used to play in Cactus. And I go, oh, dude, Cactus is so rad. Because, yeah, they're looking for somebody to sing the song. So sure enough, that evening, went over, heard the songs. Dwayne is such, was such a sweetheart. Still is. And um, he goes, can you come in and sing it the next day? So I came in and sang it. Worked it out. We sang it, sang different, did everything I could. They played it for uh, for Sylvester, and he loved it. So 
for all intents and purposes, I was it was going to be in the movie, full on, but and and I had the opportunity to go to the premiere with Sylvester, and um, he was man, what what an amazing legend that man is. I was so blessed to be around him, just how cool he was, and his knowledge of things and the business, and uh, having chats with him, and you know how much he was a part of what he is and how hard he worked. And to be able to see all that was just amazing when I was young. So I, I didn't have the same issue with, with the label and they never put it at the end of the, they never put it at the end of the movie like they were supposed to. So it was supposed to be the movie at the end, sweetest victory hits, woo, you know, whole thing, but it never happened. So fast forward to a year ago or <laughs> about, I think maybe a year ago, mm -hmm. Mr. Stallone did a director's cut of the movie and he put the sweetest victory back in at the end of the movie. <laughs> it's amazing. He recut the film the way that he wanted it. There were things yeah. that always bothered him and he directed that movie and he, he went yes. recut it. And it's so cool that he put that song back in. Oh, are you kidding me? I lit uh, Jason, you know me, how, you know how much things hit me in my heart. I cried. I mean, it, it like was, of tears of joy because I was like, God, I worked so hard on that song. I mean, they had me flying. Um, I went and when I went and recorded the, the, the final version of it, um, I went up to a studio called Bearsville, which Todd Rudgren owned up in upper, up um, upstate New York. Uh, I don't know if it's still there, Bearsville Studios, but at the time they brought me up there and you know, I have no idea who's I'm going to be singing or working with, who the producer is. So I walk in, and the producer was Jimmy Iovine. Mm -hmm. So he was the producer on that. Um, the drummer for Simple Minds was was doing the drum session when I came that day. It was just like unbelievable. People were playing on this on this track, um, and I got to really meet some amazing people. I met Cressy Hine there. Um, and they just loved my voice. So I was able to do some amazing work with people. And um, yeah, I was worked really hard. And then so now moving back forward again and the song's back in the movie. It's just like, yeah. So the song came back literally like Rocky. <laughs> yes. yes, for sure. Mark, did you so, ever think of, or maybe you did, did you ever think about doing jingles or, or uh, singing commercials and doing uh, soundtracks? Did that ever come into your life, a studio thing? No, no, never. I'd love to do stuff like that or voiceovers or things like that. Um, yeah, that would that'd be amazing. But most of it's just been music, writing, writing with other artists. Uh, I've worked with um, recently and, and wrote with my my dear friend, uh, Jesse Hughes, Mr. Father Badass from the Eagles of Death Metal. Shout out to them. I love them. I love him um, and worked with him on a couple albums that he's done here recently. But yeah, I'm just, you know, <laughs> I just enjoy doing what I'm doing right now. I really have all my oars in the water, as, an, as my grandpa would say uh, back in the day of what I'm doing right now with the music that I'm working on and writing. So it's, it's, it's quite a handful. Uh, I've had writer's block a little bit this past month as far as lyrically is concerned. So I'm starting to get back into that again, but yeah, it's a really a labor of love that I'm, trying to create something really special for our fans and the band. Yeah, well, that's a great thing for people to uh, to follow. I appreciate you coming on, Mark. I, I always enjoy talking to you, seeing you in, like uh, I said, you, Thank you. lobbies I, and Denny's or wherever else we see each other. No, totally. Like, we just saw each other on stage, and I was like, ah! <laughs> yeah. yeah! But no, thank you for having me, and, uh, and I just want to thank the fans out there uh, for believing in me still and believing in this band. Um, I love you so dearly with all my heart. Thank you for being there for me all these years and and just being stalwart friends in my life, dropping DMs to me, um, saying beautiful things and very uplifting things to me. I love you guys. And uh, I really want to thank the fans. Uh, they're, I, 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 I tell, I always say this every night. Steven, Steven had mentioned this to me because I love when you say this. I, and I mean it. I tell them, I'm not here for myself tonight. Never am here for myself. I'm here for you when I perform. That's what I do. Very well, 
Yeah, very well said. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, make sure you subscribe. Check out Mark. Check out new music from Bullet Boys coming uh, soon. Live shows uh, straight ahead. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you again.